Intel was founded with the singular goal being a semiconductor memory company to replace core memories in computers. <laughs> After Ted came up with the concept of a micro CPU for the 4004 for Busycom, and then a few months later for uh, Data Terminals Inc. Gave data Point did the design for the 8008. Intel had become a microprocessor company, as were 12 or 15 other companies in Silicon Valley. However, Intel wasn't convinced at that time that microprocessors would be a mainstream business. So a couple years later, a few years later, in 1975, Bob Noyce asked Ted to form a telecom group. Tell us about what Bob's motivation for that was and what you did and why it was important. Well, Bob, Bob always liked to think way out in the future. I mean, that was one of them. In fact, even the idea that I was hired at Intel was Bob's view. The way LSI is going, we are putting, or soon will be putting, systems on a chip. We need to start building up the systems capability of the company. And I was the first hire in that, in that category. The 11 guys came before him were all process engineers. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so the microprocessor has been launched. We've got second generation 8080 and work on ones after that. And Bob says, you know, the telephone industry seems like it's back in the 19th century. You know, they haven't added much in the way of technology. Could I look at it? and see if there was anything that Intel could do. So um, I started looking at it, and I hired a few people who were from the telephone industry who had some experience. And the thing that seemed to come up the most was the analog to digital conversion that you use. Now, it was used in those days primarily for communication between one central office and another. Originally, they would have twisted pair lines from one central office to another, and about every 6,000 feet, there'd be a loading coil to make the analog transmission characteristics correct. Well, somebody figured out at some point they could send digital data over those twisted pairs if they replaced the loading coils with repeaters. Regenerative so, repeaters. So in effect, now it was digital data, but the thing that generated the digital data was called a codec. A to D converter, they had a special code of sort of a piecewise linear approximation to a logarithmic code. So we started looking at that, and it looked to me like we could do it, and I started looking at MOS technology as a way to do analog circuitry. And one of the reasons an MOS transistor, source and drain are basically identical. So it doesn't know no, about transfer. any kind of offset. So you should be able to make a perfect switch with that. And, and then in effect we had, in fact this was a, a, another one of those moments where you, you develop something. So it seemed to me if we had a switch, and I think National was actually making an A to D converter or a D to A converter with a an array of resistors. And I figured, we are a memory house at Intel, and we could make a little tiny cell that would be one transistor and one resistor and lay out a, an array of these. So that array would be smaller than a, you know, let's say like a, for an 8-bit, smaller than a 256-bit dynamic RAM would have been, <coughs> really tiny. And as we started looking at it, one question, how well do resistors match? So I went to um, Les Videz, who was in charge of MOS and one of the experts, and asked him, how well do they match? And he said, not very well. I said, I don't want a qualitative answer. I want a quantitative answer. Can you give me a number? Well, then he admitted, no, he didn't have a number. So <coughs> Intel has these test chips. So, and the test chips have, you know, every die position is a, a little test device, and there was one resistor on each one. Mm -hmm. So I start measuring resistors and plotting 
the resistance versus position on the die to get an idea of what the distribution was. And it was a beautiful smooth curve across the wafer. Yeah, maybe the resistors on one side of the wafer would be 20% different than those on the other side, but it was such a smooth curve, it predicted if you put the two resistors side by side, they'd match within 1% or better. So that's what we did, and it made the basis for a digital to analog converter, and we used that in our first codec design, and we used that same D-Day converter to do both the digital to analog conversion on the receiving end and the analog to digital conversion on the transmitting end. Well, another thing we figured, gee, we've got this thing and you're normally broadcasting on a T1 line which has like 24 time slots. We might as well have the chip select which time slot to put in. And then we realized once we have that, we've got the basis for a switching system. In other words, we can now digitize as close to the telephone as we want and we've got the basis for a digital switch. So that was our first product, and um, turned out that at one point, Andy um, got up in an annual meeting and said Intel was, I believe, the largest non-captive producer of codecs in the world. Now, just just uh, an add-on to that, as a telecommunication professional for many years, and two stints in the 70s and the 2000s as IEEE Comstock chairman, the reason it's so important is that it facilitated time slot interchange. That is, the per channel codec could select one time, time slot, two, three, 23, six, and whatever. And so once you move time slots around, these are DSOs within a DS1, you could then do digital switching in a PBX on premises or in a class five central office switch or later on in T1 multiplexers. And this is the credit that Ted really never got. His work in LSI codecs, filters, and DSPs gave rise to digital switching.